Thanks for coming. I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, I guess I'll give a quick introduction as to who we are and then what we're going to do. Um, so my name is Andrew Clifton, and uh, this is Kyle Hogue, and we come from Kansas City, uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Quick question. I'm going to do this probably every session. How many of you guys know that Kansas City exists both in Kansas and Missouri? Awesome. How many of you know that all of the cool things in Kansas City is actually in Missouri, not Kansas? And that, I'm not saying that just because I'm from Missouri, but Arrowhead Stadium, Royal Stadium, downtown, the airport, everything is on the Missouri side, not the Kansas side. Um, and I don't like Kansas, so I have to, have to do that. So um, uh, we come from a club in Kansas City called The Legends, the Kansas City Legends Soccer Club. We've expanded and have programming for kids as young as age two all the way up to 18, and we exist now in six countries, China, Ecuador, Peru, Canada, Ireland, Scotland, and then we have programs, not on the legend side, but on our younger age side, all throughout the U.S. I think probably the closest one to here would maybe be Westchester, um, south, and then I th we've got a program in Connecticut as well for young kids. We as a club uh, focus almost exclusively on what we consider to be the most difficult parts of the game, and, and we use, uh, and, and the reason we do this is because the transfer training concept, right? So if you learn the most difficult skill, you're also learning the easier skills underneath it at the same time. And from an efficiency perspective, like you guys, we don't get the kids five days a week, right? You know, we might get them for two days a week at best, three days if we're really doing, if we're really doing well. And so we want to use the limited time we have of them to cover as much as we can. And so we tend to work on the most difficult skills and backward. And so what are the most difficult skills in our opinion? So the most difficult skills for us, in our opinion, the most difficult thing to do in a, well, a soccer game is about scoring more goals than the other team, right? So what we consider to be the most difficult thing to do in a soccer game is to actually create and break down a defense in the final third. We think that's the most difficult thing to do. It's difficult to keep retain possession on a field, yes, but we don't think passing sideways and backwards is as difficult as actually beating them in the attacking part of the field. So we work on that exclusively, almost exclusively, um, with the uh, intention um, of it transferring down. We've been around for 30 years. Um, Kyle and I are alumni of the club. We started with the club when we were five or six as players and now coach and direct for the club. So we work on deceptive dribbling and goal scoring. Um, again, almost exclusively, not entirely, and combination play, small combination play. So the session we did before was, uh, from a club perspective, how we teach the skill, the actual deceptive dribbling, to beat a defender and get past him. That's what we did in the first session. There'll be elements of that in literally every session because we these aren't our kids, so that, we're going to give them some skill work just to get them something to connect into the rest of the session. Um, today, or this session here, is going to be the 1v1 progression. So when we start working with kids, and once they develop some skill, so let's say a scissors, let's say a Cruyff turn, let's say a Maradona, right? We have six different skills we teach. Once we get them those skills, uh, we um, spend most of our sessions doing 1v1. But not 1v1 in a traditional sense of standing in lines and taking their turns. 1v1 in a everybody's going at the same time, everybody's getting a ton of touches on the ball, and it looks like chaos sense. And we do that for a few reasons, and I'll go into those as we, uh, throughout the session and kind of talk about it. Um, but let me give you the structure or the plan for the session today. So Kyle, um, who is our director of coaching for our club in Kansas City, Kyle is going to um, actually run the session. Um, uh, he's mic'd up, but just for the YouTube video that they're building, so you won't actually hear him in there. But when he's coaching, you'll hear him. Um, and he's going to put the kids through um, just a quick skill warm-up, not a fast foot work up, warm-up. I'll talk about that in a second, but a skill warm-up. And then we're going to hop into 1v1s, and you're going to see how we do our 1v1 structure during a session. Our typical session when we're doing this, um, which is for these younger age groups, 80 90% of the time, most of the time. Our typical session will start with the play, practice, play function of it. We'll play at the beginning of the session, so as the kids arrive, we'll get them quickly, literally just playing soccer. We like to do that through a game called Wembley, where every, every kid is on their own or with a teammate, and we throw several balls out, and their job is just to score. Of course, they have to do a skill, a skill being a scissors that we teach, or a Maradona, whatever skill we're working on, they have to do a skill before they score. But it's just meant to be a fun play, get started in a practice. Once everybody's there, 
the coach will have gotten every kid down into our scorebook. We keep score. I'll talk about that in greater detail as we go into it. But that's what he's doing now. He's getting every kid down into the scorebook. Typically, he knows the kids' names. So while they're playing, he's putting them into the scorebook. Today, he doesn't. So he's putting them into the scorebook as, as, as he <laughs> meets them. Um, so he gets them into the scorebook. And in our scorebook, again, we'll share all of this with you guys if you'd like it. There's a matrix. So it's already done. He knows who, to, who plays who each round. So that during a session, they'll get maybe every, they'll play everybody once uh, from the group. Um, and... Uh, and, and then once we get them into the scorebook, we'll hop into the 1v1s. The length of the rounds for the 1v1s will vary a fair bit. Um, uh, typically, a standard round is two minutes in length. However, when I was 16 and Kyle were 16 or 17 and we were playing at a really high level from a club perspective, when uh, uh, our rounds would have been four minutes in length, and they would have been really, really, really exhausting. Um, so from a physical perspective, it was fantastic for building... Um, uh, uh, building stamina and building, building, building the ability to play a 90-minute game. I've made the cardinal sin in public speaking, and I don't know who I'm speaking to. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to ask a few questions or raise a hand so I know who I'm talking to. So uh, how many of you guys are uh, coaches? Almost everybody. Got some parents in there. Great parents. You're really going to love this conversation. Um, so uh, how many of you guys coach uh, um, kids under the age of 10? Cool. How many of you guys coach kids over the age of 10? How many of you coach kids over the age of 14? Okay. It looks like we literally have it kind of across the board. So um, uh, this session would apply to, from our club, would apply literally to all of you. Um, but we want to be as efficient as possible. I'm assuming, Kyle, you're going to teach them the scissors, right? So uh, try to get us through it as fast as you can so we can get into the 1v1 stuff. So, um, so this, he's going to do the same thing we did earlier today, just to make sure these girls have a, a platform of skills. But he's going to do some static training, static meaning boring. Um, he's going to try to make it as fun as possible. In our club, these kids would have learned these skills early, and then we would be applying them all the time in the sessions. But they're just going to learn the scissors really quick, the scissors move, because when we start the 1v1, a big function of our 1v1s is them doing these skills. So he's just going to go through it really quick so that we know that they've got it, and then we're going to move on. Um, Both feet over here. Okay. There you go. Good. So the... Good. the um, okay. Now... I'm trying to determine. Don't do this. Most of you guys weren't in the earlier session, so I'll go over okay. some of the same stuff. From a static training perspective, he okay. wants to be These as quick as he can to athletic. get them just through the skill. Do you feel like you're fast like this? So we get to one v ones. No. Do you feel fast through the like skill this? and, and okay. learn it? And so, right. so this is a really easy for us. He's got him Feet behind him so that apart. they can see him okay. as they're going so to do it. So they don't have to cross mirror it in their brain. And so any skill that we teach the kids, we teach them first this way, slowly to learn the technique, not looking at them but looking at behind them. Um, in our facility uh, in Kansas City, we finally got brilliant 25 years after we were doing it, and we put a mirror on the wall. And so as a coach, you're looking into the mirror and seeing the kids behind you. S who knew dance had it right all along? Um, of course, we put a cage in front of the mirror so the kids can't break it. But that's how we teach our skills is we teach it through the mirror. I don't expect that you guys have mirrors at your training facility, so you'll see it the old school way, the way that Kyle and I learned it. Um, but we do it this way. So he's quickly teaching the kids the skill. It wouldn't be quick. It would be... Uh, compounded over practice after practice after practice after practice until we get into the 1v1 section. The reason we're choosing this skill specifically to work through, the scissors, I'm sure some of your kids that you're coaching are doing scissors in games or, or, or practices is a skill that maybe you've worked on. Um, the reason we're choosing this specific skill is, uh, is because um, for kids, we want to work with kids, not against them. And so for kids, especially in this age group, what's the first thing they do when they get a ball? The dribble in a straight line, right? When do you do a scissors? When you're dribbling in a straight time so line. So we're going to work with the kids today and not against them. Um, and so that's the reason we're choosing this skill uh, for, this, for this scenario so that the kids can learn the skill. I guess you're probably wondering why is it that we're so adamant that they learn the skill before we get into our 1v1 session. So we as a club, um, prioritize teaching these deceptive dribbling skills. And we're really focused on helping them build that self-belief and the willingness 
to embrace risk. And it's really risky to try to beat somebody in 1v1, especially with parents and everybody around watching. You may fail. And so we, we, but we're, really, we're really big believers that if they develop the ability to do that, their confidence rises. And that confidence that they have on the soccer field to beat a player in 1v1 goes into all areas of their life, right? And I got on a soapbox about that last session, and I tend to do it a lot, so I might do it here in a bit. But we're really passionate about giving them that, that ability to, to really gain that confidence, if you will. And so, um, so when we get into the 1v1s, you're going to see all of the kids are going to be playing simultaneously at, this, at the same time. And the, um, the condition that we're going to apply, and we apply this for all of our groups, is before they can score, they have to do a skill. Right? And the reason we do that is because what we don't want kids to do is we don't want kids to, um, to use their athleticism to beat a defender. And obvious reasons, right? If uh, the, the biggest, strongest, fastest kid that uses athleticism all the, all the time at, at U8, U9, U10, U11, U16, there is another level above them, and the defenders in that next level above them may be just as fast as they are. And so if they just use their speed, they're not going to get anywhere with it. And so we're going to condition into these kids that they have to use fakes. They have to be deceptive on the ball to create space. And so we're going to get them into uh, that deceptive that deceptive ability from a, uh, from a skill perspective. And so we're wanting these kids to know a skill before we get into the 1v1. The three point so he's taught them this skill really quick. Okay. Now he's given them a small right, space go. to, to focus up, in, and they're going to be doing these scissors so on the move, right? Around. An obvious progression in all terms around. of Remember, le learning grass, skill. Guys. Very good. Kyle, about two Load. minutes, we can hop into it so they can see it, and I start talking about it. Two minutes to hop into 1v1s. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so let's talk chaos for a moment. How many of you guys love chaos in practice? Yeah, a few of you raised your hands. I absolutely love chaos in practice. And uh, yesterday I was... Um, on Twitter, on the plane coming out here, and I read a tweet. I can't remember it. I wish I could because the, they, they quoted it so well. I think too often us as a soccer culture um, try to root out chaos. And I have a lot of reasons as to why I think that might be the case. And I think it might be because a lot of Brits came over in the 70s and 80s and loved really organized, cone-driven drills or sessions. Um, uh, maybe that's not, not fair. Maybe just in Kansas City, and my coach was British is why I thought that. Um, but but the, the thought process behind it is we have we've focused too much on creating really organized tr training sessions. The problem is what makes soccer the greatest game in the world, in my opinion, is because it's chaotic, right? It's 360 degrees, Right? It could be at multiple levels, it can be in many different directions, and kids have to make decisions and work their way through it. And so we as a club have uh, uh, a focus on creating chaos in every session, chaos in that we're expanding their comfort zone a little bit every time. And so when we're running our, our 1v1s, for instance, we're not going to have the girls take turns. They're all going to be going at one time because we're really, really, really big believers in the, uh, the importance of of using, of, of using that chaotic uh, frame to, for them to figure and sort it out. Um, and that's, that's an important function and piece of it. So, you ready? Cool. All right, so we're going to set up our, um, our goals. So typically for us in training, we'd actually have goals. We don't today, um, and it's not CUYSL's fault. It's my fault because I didn't request them. Um, but we're going to have two goals at two opposite sides of the training field. Um, we're going to want these goals to be close together. So for us, it's about efficiency. We want the girls or the players that we're working with to have as many pressured repetitions as possible. And so we want the goals to be close enough that they're spending their time um, shooting uh, or creating an opportunity to shoot. Defensively, Half the time, right? In the 1v1, half the time you have the ball or half the time you don't have the ball. Defensively, we want to put the defenders under pressure. So if, if we're playing and using the entire space, right, it becomes much more running and much, much less repetitions in terms of beating, or, uh, beating a player and getting a shot off right away 
like it would be in, um, in and around the box, or defensively defending a player right in front of you and having to keep them from scoring right in and around the box. And so we're going to make the field small. It's different with every age group that we work with. Um, this group specifically is why we've chosen this size of field. Um, so Kyle's got a scorebook. He's going he's gonna, to uh, give the kids their, their matchups. Each girl will have an opponent. Um, whoever he calls first will get the ball first. Um, I like to be goofy with some of the – does anybody coach like six or seven-year-olds? Awesome. I love to be goofy with my six or seven year olds. And so my favorite thing to do is, is, is to give them um, like a, they call it a code. I don't know where they got it from. Coach, what's the code? Well, the code is whoever has the longest hair gets the ball first this round or whoever has the most number of letters in their middle name. And it's really fun to have that bit. And so I've kind of stuck with that for that group for a little bit. I've now got a 2007 girls group and uh, a U12 group that I've had for a while, and I've stopped doing the code with them, um, even though I think they'd still do it and find it to be quite fun. And you, as they get older, you can give them really goofy codes. But one of them is going to have the ball first. The person that has the ball first is going to start on this end, and the defender is going to start out in front of them, right? It's going to look pretty normal, and then we're going to say go, and it's going to look like chaos, in large part because this is going to be the group's first time ever doing something like this, almost certainly. You ready? Okay. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so I think sometimes Kyle likes to just give me a hard time. Uh, we were college roommates, like literally played together the whole time. We actually don't even like each other. Um, it's interesting. So, so it's going to be chaos. And what you'll see through the, the course of this session is you're going to see the girls figure it out. Slowly, but figure it out. Every round's going to be a little bit better. They're going to be able to traverse, traverse the, uh, the area. Our coach growing up talked about bats in a cave radar, right? Bats have this, like, this, this awesome ability in a dark cave, and they can't see anyway, right? But to be able to, the thousands of them in a small space, figure it out and kind of get through it, right? Well, we are hoping to develop within these kids that bats in a cave radar, the ability to move through the space. And let me explain, and I, Roy's not in here anymore, but Roy kind of helped us come up with his concept, or Roy uh, heard this story and connected to it a little bit. Andy Barney, who was our coach and who's our founder of our club, Andy was working with the U19 women's national team in 19, I believe, 87. Roy was there the year before in 86 um, uh, to select and identify the players for the U19 women's national team, that, that, that bit. And Andy was one of the selectors, and they let the girls play for, I don't know, 20 minutes, and then they all got around and they started to try to discern, okay, where, where are we? Who, who are we really going to identify and start to look at? And <laughs> The, or maybe it wasn't 20 minutes, maybe an hour or whatever, but um, the coaches created a list of the first 10 players out of the players on the pitch that they thought belonged in the team. And, um, and those 10 players were really obvious. It's obvious the 10 that they wanted to pick. But they struggled, and Anson was just literally sitting and watching. And I can tell the story like this because Andy's told it to me literally a thousand times. Um, but uh, um, uh, Anson just sitting back watching to let him develop, and they couldn't figure out how to pick the next 20, let alone the next... Uh, the, or rank the kids from there, there after. And so after a bit, Anson stepped up and said, do you guys notice what you've just done? What is the one common denominator amongst the 10 you just picked? And they took a minute to think about it, and then they put it together. We picked all the goal scorers first. And he said, yeah, you picked all the, all the girls that are burying the ball in the back of the net. And then, then Anson said, what's the next bit that you picked? And they started thinking about it, and they said, well, guys that could, uh, that could dribble, that could create off of the dribble. And he said, yeah. He said, every time we do this, we always pick the best dribblers and the goal scorers first. And that was an epiphany for Andy. And that's why our club started to change the way we train. Andy thought, well, if I only get these kids for a little bit of time, why am I investing all of this time into teaching them the entire nuance of the game? Why don't I hyper-focus in the areas that are the most difficult that will show best in high school tryouts? college showcases, right, or um, ODP, whatever it might be. And so that's really where we got to it. So as a result, we started instituting 1v1s a ton during training session. Maya and Megan. So Maya, you'll start with a ball. And Megan, you'll we, can spread out we talked a little bit uh, in the okay. earlier session, too, so about the importance of the kids enjoying what they do. Um, and I think what we'd all say, what Maybe. kids, boys Maybe. or girls, Maybe. age doesn't matter, what they enjoy Go most about soccer is, is playing, right? And so one of the big giant wins of using this as, a, as, as really our primary function of training 
um, and practices is giving them the opportunity to play. And so let's say we're working with a group of you nines and we're training them for 115 minutes or an hour and 15, right? If we're spending 15 minutes up front doing a, just a play game at the beginning, Wembley or, or World Cup or something fun or scrimmage, and then we're, we're training for the next 45 minutes playing 1v1s largely, um, and then finishing with a scrimmage or something fun at the end, um, then the, uh, the kids are going to have a ton of fun. And that's a big function of what we do. Okay. Just to get them acclimated to it. Cool. So this is really good for you guys that haven't, uh, working with younger players specifically. Okay. You've got groups that maybe haven't done Head this up. before. Okay. This it's is this be group for us. Um, and so we're going to do a okay. one-minute so trial up. round. So they Try get the girls into introduced the okay. into what it looks Try like, and then we're going to talk with shots. him a little bit about uh, what worked and okay. what didn't. So. I see it in your eye. You're going to try it, aren't you? All right, we're going to go for one minute to start with, okay? Kyle just asked and encouraged with a smile on his face the girls to try that scissors that they just learned in the 1v1. Can you do it? Okay, play. Be creative, girls. Head up. Find space. Great scissors. That's awesome. I see one scissors already in the tight space. Good stuff, Maya. Keep playing, guys. No out of so bounds. If you'll notice, there's, there's no, no out, of out of bounds. bounds guys. Just keep playing. Um, why is there no out of bounds? Because we don't Good, want the kids spend time Ella. arguing over whether the it, ball Ellie? is out of bounds yes, or not. Yes, Ella. We want Great the kids stuff. to play. Just like they would uh, in the Tori, neighborhood the or on the streets if they maybe Good grew Olivia. up in an Good Olivia. area that used soccer as, a, as, a, as in entertainment in the evenings after school. Good, Lizzie. Oh. So on, you also Katie. notice the kids are getting a ton of touches on the ball and a ton of repetitions defending. Uh, that's what the game's about, right? Repetitions and using those repetitions to get better. Again, I know for some of you guys that said you coached 15, 16, 17-year-olds, um, and you're looking at this and going, this is awesome, this is great, but they're nine. This applies to 15, 16, and 17-year-olds just the same. Um, for a moment, to, to, I guess to brag a little bit, we as a club have been around for 30 years. We've had 60 players or so play professionally at various levels, um, from, uh, from Europe to the MLS to USL and, and, and indoor. Um, and so, but when I say we do this 90% of the time, I, that's what I mean, we do this 90% of the time in training, or 2v2s, which is our next progression, and that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Uh, or not tomorrow, uh, in the next hour, in the 2v2s applies to the older group. But it's not, <coughs> it's not um, age-related stages, instead it's skill-related stages. So our kids learn the skill first, and then apply it under pressure, playing 1v1s, great stuff. Keep going, keep going, guys, keep going, keep going. Um, and then once they've got intuitive with the skill in the 1v1, intuitive meaning they don't think about it, it literally just comes out of them, both in practice and game. Um, when I say skill, I mean scissors, I mean Cruyffs, I mean Maradonas, I mean stepovers. Then we advance them to the 2v2 stage, which is what we're doing in the next bit, which is combination play. And there's a really good story to tell you how we came up with that. So if you look at the girls, right, as coaches we all watch kids uh, and players when they're training and kind of evaluate their body language um, and, 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 and what they're doing, right? You'll see the girls right now, they're breathing hard, right? That was, that was a lot of work. They put in a lot of work for that minute or so, um, and that's good, right? That breathing hard helps them feel accomplished, helps them, helps them uh, uh, feel as though what they're doing is worthwhile, and that's a big function if you feel like what you're doing is worthwhile to want to come back and to come back and to come back, and it's that repetition of coming back and coming back and coming back that helps to build that skill set. Um, uh, and so that's important. And so that's really an important function of this is, is developing that skill set of really wanting to come back and to develop um, uh, fitness. As I got older, girl, kids in our younger ages love playing 1v1s. The monotony of doing it session after session after session for us as a club is a challenge. And we, we work through that and talk about that a lot, how we keep the kids engaged with it as we go. Because I can tell you for Kyle and I at 16 and 17, you know, um, you know going to practice and we stopped asking. At 13 and 14, we asked, hey, what are we doing in practice today? And our coach always responded with underwater basket weaving or something silly because the answer was we were doing 1v1s. As we got older, we stopped asking, but we kept coming because we were good and we were committed to the sport. And even though we didn't love doing it all the time, in part because it was somewhat monotonous and also in part because it was really exhausting, we kept doing it because we knew it was good for us. Um, in part because our coach did a good job of selling that to us. So that's one round. They're going to go through. Kyle's going to be as quick as he can to get them in the next round. Um, Shoot. 
Cool. Okay. okay so, so that was just free play. That was just free play. Okay. Okay. In so, here, girls. Um, let's get your matchups. Uh, the, in, in a typical session for us, they'd get a new opponent. In here. In here. Kyle, I don't, I don't know, know that a new opponent from the cheated yeah, matters as much. I can just start. explain how it works. Just whatever gets them going quick. So, um, so for us, you know, we take score quickly. What was your score? One nothing. Very good. Two nothing. Very good. Three nothing. Very good. One one. Very good. And then we'd say, okay, you know, Jenny versus Car uh, Carly next, and take them through to their next round. For this purposes, we're just going to get them back on the field playing, so you can see it. I'll explain why we keep score here in a moment, but to go back over, free play was at first just to introduce them to the concept. This next one, they've got to do a skill before they can score, um, and that's a, an important function uh, as well. So let's talk about scorekeeping. How many of you guys keep score in training sessions? I mean keep score outside of just when you scrimmage. Like everything, or not everything, but a lot of things are, are, are numbers. So if you, how many of you guys have read Anson Dorrance's books? Right, so I mean, Anson's a giant believer in, 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 in keeping score. Um, through training sessions. We love to do it from a club perspective um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the biggest reason for me as a coach, I love to do it because it makes it so the sessions matter. And so kids, kids are coming, and, the, and, and even if the score isn't reported publicly, it matters. And so that, that's important. Great scissors. Good work, girls. Um, and so that's a big function that we do it. We also do it because it helps us identify progress for the kids. And so for, for, for me, where I train, I have a big whiteboard, and the score goes up on the whiteboard. And at the end of the session, their goal differential is written, and then at the bottom of the goal differential, um, I'm finding a place that I can stand without being in the way. Um, at, the, at, at the end of the session, uh, the kids are ranked, uh, so they know how they finished. And I spend a lot of time talking to my girls, specifically, that it's not about finishing first or last. It's about seeing improvement within their score, right? So an improvement from that perspective. So scorekeeping for us is really important on that, on that function um, for it, and, and that's helpful. It's also really nice to give parents objective feedback. Like, look, you know, Ainsley, the last three months has averaged minus six as a goal differential for every session. But this, but but last night she got plus two, and it wasn't it wasn't a fluke. She really played well, you know, and that's great for parents too because it's objective feedback. It's just not subjective in terms of how I feel. We also, as a club, use it in terms of determining who moves up and who moves down within teams um, at tryout time. Um, uh, I wouldn't say it's the sole de de deciding factor, but it certainly um, is helpful on that front. Um, so if you'll notice as well, I think this next uh, uh, round we're going to add another change to it. Every goal that is scored, they alternate. The next person gets the ball, right? So if I'm playing Kyle and I score, Kyle gets it next and goes the other direction. This is great because it gives us both the opportunity to defend and attack. And sometimes we have teams that aren't homogenous, right? Meaning um, our teams aren't all at roughly the same level. And so... That's great, and that's what they've been doing up till now. This next round, we're going to change it, and it's going to become make it, take it. If you score, you get it as fast as you can, and you go try to score on the other goal as fast as you can. The reason we do this is actually there was a teammate of Kyle and I's growing up, a fellow by the name of Ryan Kaufman. Ryan um, was like your prototypical number nine. He got the ball, and he could create with a Matthews or touch a hop, touch an hop or a Maradon, just something a little tricky, and he could create and he could bury ball, ball in the back of the net. And we were like 10 or 11. He <laughs> would score five or six ra goals in every two-minute round. But he never defended. He's your typical number nine. Like literally didn't defend because he knew once the ball went in the back, back of the net, he'd go get it. He'd score, and he'd win every round five to four because chances are the other guy probably missed one or two throughout the session. He probably only missed one. And so our coach wised up to it and said, you know what, I've, <laughs> I've got to make Ryan actually work if I'm going to do my job as a coach. So I'm going to change this and make it, make it, take it. And Ryan went from middle-ish of the pack because he usually only won by one or two to the bottom of the pack immediately when he changed it to make it, take it because he couldn't defend. He didn't want to defend. He didn't want to put the effort into it. And so he never got the ball until he ch changed his mind and decided to defend. And so for us as a club, we don't do make it, take it out of the gate because for like with my five-year-olds and six-year-olds that I coach, we do like two rounds of 1v1 every night in addition to everything that you saw in that first session. Um, and we have a couple games that we didn't show that I should tell you guys about if you're interested later. But um, we do run 1v1 rounds every night. But it's really defeating if you're on the bottom end of your team and you spend the entire round defending. 
And so we don't do make it, take it in that scenario. But as our group gets older, right, and, and they're more similar, so it's going to be about 50-50 success and failure within a normal 1v1 round, then we'll start to do make it, take it some of the time. Some of the time when we really want to get the kids to take it up another notch, really put a little bit more effort into what they were doing before. And then as we get older, to those of you guys that might, I think, said you were coaching high school, everything is make it, take it. It is dog eat dog. And we love it from a developmental perspective because I can tell you I played Division I, um, uh, you know, high-ish level. We were actually a bad Division One team, to be fair. But I played at a high level, and I could go into a training session and know we were going to play non-directional keep away, or right, 6v6v6, or some attack first defense. And if I just was having a bad day, I could hide and go through the motions in that session. But not once during my club career, when we play 1v1s or 2v2s, 2v2s being what we're doing next at, at, in 30 minutes, um, uh, not once during my club career could I hide because I would just be chasing the ball the entire time, and it was miserable. And so we love 1v1 from a perspective of is you can't hide. There's nowhere to go. From a life lessons, life character development piece, it's maybe the best thing. Because as adults, we've all had times when something's really just not going right, and we can't go hide, right? You got a water bill coming up. You got to go to work because you got to pay the water bill, right? There's, you just don't have a choice. And so for kids, I think it's a great character developer when we can put them in situations where they can't go hide and help build that life skill. But also from a soccer perspective, it's great too, right? Because we all have that game at the end of the game where we've got to figure out how we're going to make it work. You know, two minutes to go, we're down by a goal. Somebody's got to step up and be a hero. If they spent so, I mean, literally year after years of this, session after session doing 1v1s, they're going to have built that self-confidence that said, give me the ball, I'll take it, and I'll go. And in our club team, everybody was like that. But when I got to high school, only a few of us were like that. And so we naturally became the captains of the team. Not necessarily because we were the best players, but because we had the attitude that was give it to me. You know, I'm going to lead it. I'm going to go for it. And that carried on, I think, in, in, in many other areas of life outside of the soccer field. So they're playing make it, take it now so you can see it and experience it. This is great. They're still with the condition of they've got to do a skill before they can score um, uh, or shoot. Um, but, uh, um, uh, but it's make it, take it. So it, once somebody scores, they get it as quick as they can and they come. Let's talk about the space for a little bit. How many of you guys train all the time in a gym like this? Great. <laughs> All the time, I can help you with some idea. Just in the winter. Two out of three days. These gyms are tough, right? To be honest, we tried to evaluate how we were going to do this session. In a perfect scenario, we would have done it this way because there wouldn't have been giant space behind for the kids to go chase the balls, right? We would have gone this way. But I think you guys would have been miserable if you kept getting pelted with balls. So we went this way to point it out. Also, it's a gym floor. Gym floors are tough to control a ball on. That's why futsal balls are low bounce, because they need to be to make it um, uh, manageable for, for, for the kids and the players. Um, and these aren't futsal balls. So, uh, so, but outdoor, what we do is we try to find a space on the field that's tight but somewhat confined. As a club, and I won't go down this road too much, but just over a 30-year progression, we now train exclusively indoor, and we have, we have indoor training, um, an indoor training center, two of them now, that have small fields all with walls around them. We've done this because we've recognized and we, as we've grown, we've had the money to invest in to create spaces where it's super efficient and the kids don't have to chase the balls ever, right? The less chasing of the ball, the more development time. But when you're running your session, you want to find a space that, you know, if there's fences, I'll run right up to the fence, right? I, oftentimes, I never train in the middle of the field because it would be terrible. And I try to avoid training on turf if I can because on turf, when they hit the ball and it goes, it goes forever, right? So I'll train on turf if I have to, but when I do train on turf, I try to find some barriers around me to help keep the ball um, uh, in play and, and, and moving. Um, let me look and see what other. Okay. Dance? Yeah, that's good. Okay, okay so, um, so we've just talked about, uh, we've been talking about offense mostly or attacking play, right? Um, we spent some time teaching them a skill, and if you could imagine, expand that on multiple sessions. So they're really going for those skills. We haven't talked about defense much. 1v1's great from a defensive perspective because you either have the ball or you don't. If you don't, 
you can work on specific individual tactics of defending, right? So jockey, right, putting them onto their weak foot. You're delaying them. Your job isn't to win the ball. Your job is literally to delay them so the rest of your team can get behind you, and you're going to channel them into the direction that you want. So we can spend time going through that technique as well. Kyle's going to go over it briefly just to apply it to the next bit, but so that you guys as coaches can see that as, as, as a possibility. When we talk about conditions, um, in our in our rounds or in our in our sessions, we slowly layer in more conditions. Yeah, this is something that we would start implementing at this age, but quite frankly, it would take three, four, five years even before they consistently every single time started to do it. Um, but if we start introducing it at a young age, they'll start to pick it up um, you know, gradually, and you'll start to see it within games. But I don't expect it to happen today. Session one. Yeah. No. Okay, so, um, so conditions. So we slowly add conditions, conditioning the kids as it sounds so that it just comes out of them. They don't think about it, right? And so, like, the first condition we applied to 1v1 was they had to do a skill before they could score, right, or shoot, right? And so that's number one skill for, uh, condition for us, and that carries on throughout, but we add more conditions as we go. Um, some issues we get with kids, and I'm sure you as coaches can imagine this, we get with kids, is like, oh, you got to do a skill before you score. Okay. Kick it and run, right? They do their skill, they've satisfied it, then they kick it and they run and they carry on. And so then as soon as we're seeing that, then the next condition is, okay, you've got to do a skill and explode before you score. Right? So you got to do a skill, and you've got to explode to space immediately before you can score. And then we build from that. And this isn't from, like, one practice to the next. This is, like, over, over long periods of time. It's not until they master it and it becomes intuitive, the previous condition, do we add the next condition in. Because we want to stretch kids' comfort zones, but we want to do it in a scaffolded, manage, manageable way. Right? We don't want to give the kids too much at once for obvious reasons. So, um, so we'll, we'll build from there. Um, uh, various shots, right? So let's say we've spent some time talking about, you know, maybe you got a group that's, 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 that's playing and they're, and they're beating players and going for it, but they're not taking shots early in their opportunity, right? It's almost like they want to pass the ball or dribble the ball in the back of the net. So we've noticed that. We'll start talking about it, and then we'll add a condition in, right? That if you have to have a power shot, toe down, ankle locked, Otherwise, it doesn't count. No matter where you are in the 1v1 round, right? So let's say you hit a merit on a turn and you're here. You can't pass it because I'm wanting you to take a power shot. So you're going to be toe down, ankle locked, and that's what you've got to put into it. Or maybe they're hammering the heck out of the ball every single time and in the games or whatever and it's just flying everywhere. All right, you can't, you can't, shoot, sh you can't score by uh, just banging the ball in the back of the net. Maybe it's going to be in the side netting of the net. So we're going to focus on placement as, as, as a condition. So you can layer those conditions in as you go. Um, and that's really, really helpful to ensure. One of my favorite condition to layer in is I find when I'm working with kids and they're working with skill in the 1v1 often is they get to where they feel like they need to do the skill and then another skill and then another skill until the player falls down and then they can go by them. That, like, that's common for my groups, right, that I've coached. And so, like, I, you know, I, I've beaten it over and over. Guys, they're, like, they're good defenders. They're not just going to fall down for you to run by them. Like, that, not everything's and one YouTube, right? So you've got to actually beat them with the skill. But how much space do you need to beat them? This much. That's all you need, right? You just got to squeeze a shot by them. And so then the condition that I've started to layer into my sessions is you've got to do a skill with a play away touch, and then the next touch has to be a shot. Otherwise, it doesn't count. The goal doesn't count, right? And so then the kids are thinking more from a perspective, okay, speed of play, quick play. One of the negatives um, that we have to work through from a coaching perspective is that our speed of play with our teams when they're younger and they've been getting faces is really, really, really slow. They take a ton of touches before they do anything because their, their brains are trying to work through what skill to use and how to create space with that skill and all of those things. And so we're really trying to figure out, okay, if they're going to take all those touches and really think through all of that, we've got to start to increase their speed of play. And so we wait to do it until they've gained confidence with their skills. Um, and then once they've gained confidence with their skills, we start to institute conditions that are going to increase their speed of play. 
Also, it's not uncommon for me to walk on the field clapping next to kids that are killing grass and not going anywhere with their skills, right? Like, come on, quick, 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 quick let's go. Um, and that helps to increase the speed of play on the field. So Kyle's talking about the defensive technique really quick just to give them some perspective. And then uh, they're going to go into, wow, that's bad when I get close. They're going to go into the 1v1, and the condition is going to be if you win the ball off of the, the attacker, but you weren't using the proper technique, right? Whatever piece of that technique, maybe it's jockeying. If you weren't jockeying and delaying, then they get the ball back, right? So you've got to act. Or if you dive in and win the ball, would be another condition. You don't get it, right? You've got to do it the right way. You've got to wait for them to make a mistake, whatever it might be. So from a coaching perspective, the environment is the teacher, right? And you as a coach can control the environment. So you can put conditions in that are going to put at, that are going to make them give the output of what you want. Instead of thinking, okay, what's my next drill that's going to teach them how to do X? You can use 1v1 or 2v2. Or for us, sometimes we'll play 4v4 as well, which we'll talk about in the last session. Um, you can use the game and use, uh, um, use conditions to create the, the output that you're looking for, if that makes sense. There you go. OK, so let's all start. Quarter turn, and then wait on this way. OK, there you go. You also Good. notice, guys, um, we've got one awesome kiddo here hanging out. So we've got an odd number. What do you do with your odd numbers? So. Um, for us, we sometimes ready? we'll have uh, one in goal on one end, and then I'll hop in goal on the other end and play goal while coaching. Sometimes we'll have the odd number work on fakes and moves on the side, right, working on skill. Sometimes this odd number is somebody that's ran into and bumped somebody in the head, and they need to sit out and take a, take a breather, if that makes sense. Our matrix that we have in our book that I'm happy to message or email anybody that want it, wants it, um, our matrix has... Um, has all of it sorted out. So every round, somebody different sitting out, and it's easy to work through from that perspective. The other thing, too, is this isn't nearly as chaotic as I expected it to be, to be honest. We've given them a fair bit of space, and the balls are escaping past the goals, which gives them even more space. Um, but uh, um, as they... As they traverse this chaos, right, a big coaching point for us as coaches is go find space. You're doing your skill to find space, doing your skill to find space, and, and, and you have to go somewhere to find that space. And that's, that's really, really important. But then it's a great transition to the games. Because you could imagine, if you train most of your kids this way this spring, what are they going to do when they go to the field? They're going to be in each other's way all the time, right? Because not, you're not talking to them about movement off the ball. You're not talking to them about about uh, tactics, you're not talking to them about switching the field of play all so much. I mean, you can, so, uh, you can but you, you're not, it's not a, a, a common topic at training. So, um, so with that in mind, you, you know, how did, so you talk about finding space here within the 1v1 pitch, and then you go to the fields and you're saying, like for me, when I'm coaching even my five and sixes, I'm coaching the guys around the ball more so than with the ball, because the guys with the ball know that their job is just to do skill and explode. And I'm coaching everybody around him, Johnny, give him space, give him space, Johnny, get back away, give him space, right? Just to create space for Johnny to use his skills, knowing that he's going to lose it at some point, earlier, as at an at a, at a earlier stage of development. Um, and then when he loses it, that's when you know, Sarah might get it, and that's when it's her turn to go for it and create space. But again, it's economy of training, right? Uh, using, trying to accomplish the most important stuff um, in the time that you have. Not accomplish everything. You certainly don't want to try to teach your teams everything um, because th they'll get nothing. I hear heavy breathing. I am? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I am. Ah, I had one other uh, story I wanted to tell. It's, it's a good one. Um, so um, uh, when I was, I don't know, 11 or 12, I went and tried out for ODP for the first time. And I'd been training exclusively as a kid this way from 6 to then. And I, didn't, I had no concept for how good I was. I'm going to try out for ODP, the entire state of Missouri. And I live in Kansas City, so St. Louis was the bee's knees when it came to soccer at that time. It's not anymore. 
Um, but, uh, um, you know, oh, I'm going to try to get to these St. Louis kids. Who knows how I'm going to do? And so I go to ODP, and um, uh, I, got, I, got, I was playing pretty well. And actually, the story doesn't actually connect to me. There was another kid, you know, like your typical uh, player that's got, you know, great haircut. He's got the orange soccer shoes on, right? You know, the socks are pulled up just right. And really good with the ball at their feet, right? Can do all the juggling tricks, all of that stuff. Like, really, like, the kid walks up to the field, and you're like, oh, this kid's going to be able to play. Um, and he was there, and during whatever drill we were doing, he got the ball, and he was in the middle of the field, and if you could imagine the center circle, and he took like 25 touches, all these awesome, like, fast footwork-ish tricks and, and movements and all this stuff, but he literally went nowhere. Like, literally went nowhere, right? But looked great going nowhere in that space. And I had a, uh, the, the, the ODP coach at the time, he, I don't know where he was from, but he had an accent. Um, and so, so it's kind of this heavy accent. He stops, stop, 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 stop. Yells at the player, whatever the player's name, like, hey, like, that's great. It looks really good, but it's kind of like peeing in a wetsuit. It gives you a nice warm feeling, but it goes nowhere, right? And so, so for us as, 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 as coaches that coach this way, that's something that we have to talk about with the kids. We don't tell the wetsuit story, but talk about the kids often, right? We don't spend a lot of time doing fast footwork, right? Fast footwork is great, and it has its... its um, it's great for developing confidence and, and, and coordination with the ball and giving you this great technique to be able to receive and pass and move through tight spaces and all that. That's great. But again, from an efficiency perspective, we only have the kids for a little bit of time. And so we don't do fast footwork in training. We do the skill work that ends in an explosion every time. So the goal isn't to look good in the center circle. The goal is to do a skill and explode to space to create something from it. For us, in 1v1, is to create a shot and only a shot. But if you can bury the ball in the back of the net from the top of the box... You can also play a forward penetrating pass, right? It's the economy of training, and it, and it comes down from there. And so that's a big function for us as a club. Um, and I think it's an important story to be able to connect to the kids. Like, go somewhere. Go somewhere with it, right? It's not enough just to do a skill and to kill grass or to pee in your wetsuit. you got to go somewhere, right? Because that, that's really ultimately what matters. Um, so um, as we start to wrap up, uh, I've got a, a, a sheet that I, I brought that has um, an opportunity for you to put down your name and your email address. That's really all I need. Um, uh, if you want your phone number or whatever else you can. But what um, we as a club have created, um, we have a giant uh, YouTube channel with a ton of content for you as coaches to be able to um, uh, uh, gain some perspective or get some help in terms of how we teach each skill specifically broken down in really intense ways. Also for some of the sessions, what our 1v1s and 2v2s look like for our kids. But then as well, because this stuff is really different, we've built out a pretty big library that, t that talks about like the philosophy for why we do what we do, but with actual Legends players doing it in games. Um, and so that's a great... Um, a great tool for us as a club to help parents buy into why we do some of the crazy stuff that we do do. Um, and so for you as coaches, I'm happy to connect you to that. Um, we also have a you know, book and some other coaching resources that, honestly, they're all free um, that we'd be happy to share with you. And so if you have any interest in learning more on those fronts, if, I think this fellow right here has that piece of paper um, you know, get your name on there, and then I'll make sure to be able to email to you as well. We are obnoxiously passionate about um, uh, uh, giving kids this platform to become more brave, willing to embrace risk, uh, more creative, looking at problems as, hey, I'll come up with a solution to solve it, and those two things develop leadership skills. And so as a result, we are happy to connect with literally anybody anywhere to help to give them um, resources or help um, uh, from a training perspective. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of feel like that's, that's our mission as an organization. So uh, we're more than just a club in Kansas City. Um, with that said, um, I have nothing else for you guys now. I guess I'll preview the next session that we're going to do is 2v2s. So it's going to be like the 1v1 is great to develop the ability to beat somebody off a dribble, but now how do you combine in wall passes and overlaps and, and in tight spaces to break down a defense in the attacking third, right? Passing is a big function of soccer. This is literally all we do with passing. So it's the next session. So um, thanks again.